Welcome to another episode of the Federal Newswire Lunch Hour Podcast with your host, Andrew Langer. Well, hey there, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Lunch Hour with Federal Newswire. I'm your host, Andrew Langer. And if you're watching us on YouTube, you know, you can always catch us on wherever you find your fine podcast needs, uh, Spotify, Amazon, uh, Apple, etc. If you're listening to us on one of those fine podcast platforms, you can check us out on YouTube. Uh, you're going to want to do that. Please uh, subscribe, leave a review, let everybody in your life know all about the Lunch Hour with Federal Newswire. Joining us today, very excited to bring him on. His name is Frank Gaffney. He is the founder and president of the Center for Security Policy in Washington, D.C. The center is a non-profit, non-partisan educational corporation established in 1988. Under Mr. Gaffney's leadership, the center has been nationally and internationally recognized as a resource for timely, informed, and penetrating analyses of foreign and defense policy matters. He is the author of the book, The Indictment, prosecuting the Chinese Communist Party and friends for crimes against America, China, and the world, as well as war footing, 10 steps America must take to prevail in the war for the free world. In April of 1987, Mr. Gaffney was nominated by President Reagan to become the Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Policy, the senior position in the Defense Department with responsibility for policies involving nuclear forces, arms control, and U.S.-European defense relations. He acted in that capacity for seven months, during which time he was the chairman of the prestigious high-level group NATO's Senior Political Military Committee. He also represented the Secretary of Defense in key U.S.-Soviet negotiations and ministerial meetings. Mr. Gaffney's leadership has been recognized by numerous organizations, including the Department of Defense Distinguished Public Service Award, the U.S. Business and Industry Council's Defender of the National Interest Award. I am, I'm a big fan of the next one, the Navy League of the United States Alfred Thayer Mahan Literary Achievement Award. I'm a huge Mahan fan myself. And the Zionist Organization of America's Louis Brandeis Award. Mr. Gaffney holds a Master's of Arts degree in International Studies from the Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies, also known as SAIS, and a Bachelor of Science in Foreign Service from the Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. Frank, I dare say neither Georgetown nor Johns Hopkins would allow either of us to be students there today, I suppose. I think that's probably true. I was kind of surprised they let me in the first time. <laughs> so, I, uh, I, I have so a... Now. Uh, I have an undergraduate degree in international relations from William and Mary with a concentration in Soviet studies. So, and, and did a lot of work on geostrategic thought issues. In fact, I wrote a paper my senior year about the geographic underpinnings of Soviet defense strategy. Mahan obviously uh, plays a, a great uh, role in any, anybody who's interested in geostrategic policy. So that's why I was so very intrigued by that. Anyway, I'm sorry. So, so talk about, talk about Mahan, talk about some of your early writing. Well, thank you for that very fulsome introduction. Uh, yes. I had, um, uh, I think it's fair to say, an extraordinary experience early in my life um, with uh, senators like Scoop Jackson and John Tower, and then obviously with President Reagan and Cap Weinberger at the Pentagon. Um, it's been more or less downhill ever since, I think, <laughs> career-wise, sure. to be honest with you. But uh, along the trail, we've done a lot of writing. I guess I had 25 years of columns every week in the Washington Times. and. Um, a lot of other uh, essays and uh, commentaries. Uh, I've been doing radio and television for uh, radio for 15 years and television for about four. So um, there's a lot out there. Uh, you won't necessarily get the best angle on it from uh, Google and Wikipedia, but uh, please do check out things like our Center for Security Policy. And by the way, I'm the executive chairman of it. Uh, my there colleague Tommy Waller is the president these days, but securefreedom.org is where you can find uh, an awful lot of that content. And, and I appreciate you And we will come back and let you, let you tout the website again, again at the end. Sure. So let's start here um, because, you know, you and I met up at CPAC uh, just about a month ago. Um, you were, uh, uh, with Margaret Byfield, who's been a guest on this show before she and I have talked about natural asset companies. I, I want to pull it back at the 30,000 foot level, or in the case of the military, let's say the 70,000 foot level even, and talk about the dangers to American sovereignty and this idea of the, the, the prevailing power structure for whatever reason, wanting to sell out on American sovereignty. Talk about that issue and why it's so vital. I think it's so vital, partly because it's so inconceivable 
yeah. to the vast majority of Americans that that anybody, let alone somebody who had formally sworn, as I did, an oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, would think that they could possibly be involved in the surrender of our sovereignty uh, at the expense, obviously, of our constitutional form of government and freedoms. And yet that's what we're confronting now. And and you mentioned Margaret Byfield. She is a tremendous right resources, you know, an ally in uh, one of the fights to try to prevent them from succeeding, which was narrowly averted about a month and a half ago, I guess now, um, the New York Stock Exchange was trying to figure out crazy. a way to manufacture out of whole cloth, a new class of public companies that would be basically used to try to take over and, and manage or control effectively um, vast swaths of American public lands, waters, air, uh, and other natural resources. And um, with her leadership, we were able to stave that off, at least temporarily. But again, it's animated by this idea that in the interest of uh, climate change protection or in the interest of um, just advancing more control at a kind of global level rather than at a national one, um, they were going to try very hard to enable oh, people like the Chinese Communist Party's <laughs> sovereign wealth fund to yeah. buy up some of those assets that I just mentioned and thereby control them and thereby facilitate their efforts to take us down. This is the issue of, you know, in the end, it would obviously, you know, we've got concerns about the commoditization of these resources. We've got problems with the commoditization of the resources and major Wall Street hedge funds being in control of them. We've got, then it gets into the issues of the commoditization, the Wall Street hedge funds being in control of them, other folks being in control of them. And then they're being to ex their, their ability to exert command and control decision-making over the utilization of these resources to the detriment of others, right? We know that the left wants people off of people and cattle and people and resource utilization off of the public lands of which there's so much west of the Rocky Mountains, um, you know, some of it, I'm sorry for, that if I'm all over the place here, Frank, but, you know, one of my one of my favorite examples, and I mean this very much in terms of gallows humor, is Raul Grijalva calling for uh, turning public lands along the U.S.-Mexico border into wilderness to create essentially full-flowing corridors for illegal migrants to come through, understanding how difficult it is to patrol a wilderness area using wilderness vehicles, uh, using uh, motorized vehicles. I mean, this is what we're talking about here, isn't it? Well, kind of. I, I mean, look, uh, what we've discovered is that you don't need wilderness areas. Uh, right. You can just open the border. And that's, of course, what Joe Biden that's has good done. Point. But I, I did want to make one point because it's really critical here. Um, it's not just public lands that these people have their eyes on. It mm. is also private land that has been put into conservation easement. Yes. A and a lot of people have, you know, put their farms in those kinds of arrangements in trust in the expectation that, you know, the character of them would be preserved. Well, it turns out while the, the you know, sort of claim of all of this is that there will be no productive use of any of these lands that are held uh, or managed by these uh, so-called natural asset companies. In point of fact, if they decide that that piece of land could be used for sustainable purposes, uh, like, uh, oh, I don't know, a wind farm yes, or a solar farm, or maybe even an, an industrial facility manufacturing electric vehicle batteries. Mm. Well, then they could perfectly well say that's permitted and uh, there goes that pristine land. And if you happen to be the farmer or the person who was, you know, the steward of that land and wanted it to be turned over to your children in that condition, sorry, this natural asset company arrangement could do dang near anything that they want. And it would be I believe a very serious blight on our right. country and on its people, if in some future 
modified arrangement, they seek to pull the same thing off. Uh, I hope we'll be able to beat them the next time as well. Well, we we were able to beat them only because enough folks were able to get a, you know get a hold in the right states. Were able to sort of put pressure on the SEC and and the administration to to do this. One of the problems, of course, right, Frank, is that that they have they have enunciated what they want to do. They have said this is our goal, and you and I both know that when they they have their goal down the field, they start marching down that goal. We beat this one back. The next time, well, there already is a next iteration, isn't there? Well, I haven't seen uh, the whites of its eyes just yeah. yet, but I think it's out there. And uh, it, it's probably going to take uh, one of several forms. I think yeah. we've got to be alive to this possibility that uh, they're relentless, as you say. Right. And, and just, you know, one further point on that is that as you look at um, this kind of undertaking, one of the things that it has in common with similar mm. sorts of things, and I, I know we're going to be talking about another of my passions oh, yes. of the moment, but it's the stealthy way in which right. these things are being perpetrated that is so infuriating. Uh, it'd be one thing if they went to the American people and said, hey, we've got an idea. Right. And here's the plan. And uh, we'd like to debate it. And we'd like to have a vote on it. Get get right. the assent of the American they don't do that. And why? Well, Andrew, they don't do it because the American people would not go for it. That's why. And, and, that's, and that's what makes this so insidious. And uh, and I think it must be stopped. It, it's a situation. It's funny you say that because I wasn't aware, and I'm somebody who outside of my media work, my listeners and viewers know this, Do I do regulatory work. That's my, that's my great passion in life is dealing with these kinds of rulemakings and these proposals that come out. I was not made aware of this until I want to say a week after the first comment period was was done, like it had already done and passed. I think that maybe when I sat down with maybe Margaret Byfield or maybe uh, Gabrielle Hoffman, I don't remember. And so I, you know, I'm someone who was in this field and I was not aware of this. And 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 part of the problem is finding out about these until it's until it's too late, right? Because there are at least 3,000 separate rulemakings a year. Nobody is watching all of them or can watch all of them. And it means if you don't know what you're looking for, you might miss something. That's part of how they do this, isn't this, Frank? A hundred percent. Yeah. And and again, I, I think your point is very well taken, Andrew, that you know, if you're even a specialist in the area, right. somebody who is following professionally these sorts of things and they can slip it by even you right god help the rest of us and so exactly. you know it's 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 watchdogs and i just want to again say thank you to margaret byfield for 100%. being one of those uh, watchmen on the wall as they with, say with, without a doubt knowing what knowing what you're looking for you know it's 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 coming in a heritage that started with her parents yes and the work that the property rights movement did she and i've talked about this you know it's I, I can only imagine i don't know if you if you ever got to work with ron arnold or chuck cushman or these giant of Don't the property so. rights movement. But I, this is the kind of stuff that that I know. So Chuck Cushman was a property rights activist from, from the West, Ron Arnold as well. They would have been warning about this well in advance and folks wouldn't have listened until until it was too late. Let me Almost. let me pull it back for a second, Frank, before we get into the World Health Organization stuff, because that I want to I want to talk to you about. I want to I want to circle back to this issue of the oath to the Constitution and the issues of sovereignty. Um, and you're someone who negotiated with the Soviet Union in the 80s. I think you have in the same way that I do a healthy, had a healthy skepticism, still have a, 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 as a healthy skepticism of things that the, the Russians have been doing to undermine Western society. Um, the Russians just had a conversation with somebody about this. Khrushchev in 1962 announces, you know, at the UN, he, it was widely reported, we will bury you. What he was really saying is we will be at your funeral. He was promising then to use the things that we hold dear, the basic tenets of Western classical liberal Republican democracy against us and to unravel us. And here we are 60 years later, 60 plus years later, and we have people in going into government service, this is my point, who out and out hate the Constitution and hate the principles by which the Constitution stands. How do you swear? Do they not care? They, obviously, they don't care about the oath, but there's something very jarring about people who swear an oath to protect and defend a document with which they have great reservations about the, the writing of it. Talk a little bit about this and, and very, you know, from that, from that 70,000 foot level. 
Yeah, I guess that they would rationalize it or justify it as uh, a case where the ends justify the means. Sure. Uh, That's classic Marxism. And I think that's what we're contending with here. And the the thing that is frightening, honestly, is that there are so many who seem now to have embraced Marxist uh, values. And uh, we're, we're in great danger as a result, especially that they're inside the proverbial wire. You, you, you go down the road. We have a Cold War. We nominally win the Cold War. At least the Soviet Union is defeated. Uh, the Central European nations that were within the Warsaw Pact, some of them come over to our side. Some of them don't. Some of them just sort of go back and forth over time. Some of them struggle in, in the post-Soviet era. Uh, but we we think that we have defeated the concept of Marxism and shown that it doesn't work. It doesn't work in it, it doesn't work the, given the promises that Marx supposedly said. Though I do think that it it delivers exactly the way Marx wanted it to, and Lenin and Stalin and Mao, etc. You know the 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 dictatorship of the proletariat is made very very real, um, and yet you have folks who still have this belief, this misguided belief that we can create this great Marxist utopia around the world if it just is put into practice properly. Talk about how that's going into practice now. Talk about what's going on at the World Health Organization and elsewhere. Yeah. Well, I'm fond of pointing out, as we do in our book, which you very kindly mentioned, The Indictment, indictment, yes, uh, that we have been subjected uh, since the end of the Cold War, and I, I think you're absolutely right. In fact, we had a conversation with some scholars about this earlier today that the Soviets more or less just went into a sort of chapter 11 reorg <laughs> rather than going out of business. But they were succeeded by the Chinese Communist Party, right. which vowed in the person of Deng Xiaoping, the general secretary at the Chinese Communist Party, when the Soviet Union fell, that that Cold War between the United States and the Soviets was over. The Soviets had lost. There was a new Cold War beginning between the United States and China, Mm -hmm. and China would win. And what they've done ever since, basically, and are pursuant to a strategy he called the hide and bide strategy, Mm -hmm. was conduct themselves in a way that induced us, many, not all of us, but many of us in particular in the Wall Street and business sector more generally, government, academia, Hollywood, you know, out of the media, to believe that if only we helped make them strong, they would become more like us and we would all get along. Uh, That was not the purpose of the strategy, the the hiding, yes, but not the not the ultimate not, end state. And right. one of the things that they adopted was what came to be called in 1999, the book was published entitled Unrestricted Warfare. Mm. And it basically was the playbook of what they were going to do to win the Cold War against us without firing a shot, if necessary, if possible, if necessary, they would uh, hopefully over time have the means to do the shot firing as sure. well. And I think that's about where we find them now. But that unrestricted warfare had one element that was particularly insidious. A lot of them were, but this one yes. I found particularly insidious. And that was the use of so-called international organizations to try to affect a new kind of global governance. That's Mm. a term that the current General Secretary Xi Jinping uses to essentially eliminate nation states and their individual forms of governance in favor of rule by these international elites controlled by, guess what, the Chinese Communist Party. And the World Health Organization just happens to be at the vanguard of that effort right now. And as we talk today, in 10 weeks' time, wow, the Chinese Communist Party, the World Economic Forum, the European Union, Bill Gates, Big Pharma, and of course, the Biden administration, hope to formalize an, not one, but two agreements that would effectively surrender the sovereignty of the United States over public health to the dictator, I said dictator, the director general who would become a dictator of the World Health Organization. Again, going back to the NACs, the only conceivable way this could happen 
is if we are all unwitting that it's right. even under discussion, <laughs> let alone right. perilously close to being approved. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting because we talk about the issue. Folks are focused on their lives, right? That's the that's the that's part of you know the, the how how this operates is that folks are focused on their lives and yes, especially sometimes free people, yeah. right? Especially free people. Um, and I'll, I'll give you an example at the other end of the spectrum, right? Which is it, you know we talk about part of the reason why we don't want a global governance is because we have very little control over it. It's very far removed from the people. But you know, one of the things that I'm reminded of, Frank, is when municipalities, counties, cities, they buy codes, municipal codes, you know, whether it's electrical codes or plumbing codes or fire codes or whatever, they buy them from these sometimes international, but a lot of times national standard setting organizations, and they don't read through them before they, they, they buy them off the shelf and then they adopt them. And, and what these, these organizations have written without anybody looking through them becomes law. I'll give you, you know, an example that I like to use is uh, uh, up in New Hampshire, municipality had bought a, a plumbing code, and part of the plumbing code said that any business has to make their bathrooms available to the general public. Uh, some homeless person came into a Goodwill, wanted to use the bathroom. The Goodwill had a policy of not allowing folks to use their bathroom, so this person relieved themselves in the uh, in the Goodwill. And when the police showed up, instead of taking this person who had engaged in public urination and taking them off to jail, the goodwill was given a, a citation from the government for violation of, the, of this code. Now, that's at a very local level, but the point is, these the folks who passed this weren't paying attention to everything that was in this code. By the same token, you know, if someone hears the World Health Organization, well, how can the World Health Organization be bad? It's the World Health Organization, and yet... Here we are. I'm sorry, go ahead. But the interesting thing is that we actually know yeah. how bad it is because right. we've all lived through the pandemic of COVID-19. Yes. And, and I know you remember, and I'm sure all of our listeners do as well, the pandemic of, uh, you know, 2020, 2020 2024, yeah, yeah uh, brought us the most unbelievable transformation of our country. Right. Not just the, the health issues, of course, but all of the ripple effects, because why? At the advice of the World Health Organization's director general, mm. a Marxist plucked from obscurity in the government of Ethiopia by the Chinese Communist Party. Right. We were told that the right response to this pandemic, this disease, COVID-19, was to adopt the China model. And what was the China model? The China model that we were recommended to adopt was mask mandates, social distancing, lockdowns, mandatory vaccinations with inadequately tested vaccines mm -hmm. and all the rest. And the reality is that was, I believe, directed by the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, Interesting. to this fellow, Tedros Cabrasis. And now what we're talking about that's different is it wouldn't be advisory any longer. Under this new arrangement, Tedros Cabrasis would be given the authority to dictate when we have a public health emergency. And by the way, not just a pandemic, Andrew. It could be climate change. It could be, right. uh, I don't know, migration. It could be gun violence. Gun violence. And then yes. what we must do about it. Not what we should do, but what we must do, and count on it, it will be the China model again. It, it, it's interesting, Frank. Talk to us all about this interplay, right? We, I recognize, again, I have a degree in international relations, so I know when we negotiate a treaty, in any nation negotiates a treaty, it, you, you give up some measure of your sovereignty in order to become, you know, to have this negotiation with this other power or the global. But the point is that because they're, if they're, ratified properly, if they are actually ratified as a formal treaty, it su it's technically supersedes our constitution, at least the way I, I understand this. Folks don't understand that. I mean, it, obviously, it takes a president and leadership to turn around and say, you know, uh, yeah, we didn't sign on for this when we ratified this treaty. So, you know, we're going to ignore this, do our best. But you get somebody like a Barack Obama or a Joe Biden or a Gavin Newsom or a Westmore of Maryland 
um, who is all too happy to go along with this, they're just going to say, you know something, we signed a treaty, we got to do this. This is our, our obligation because we want to be leaders in the global, the global community. That's part of the danger here is that while there are some presidents who will stick up for what's best for America and put America first, there are other presidents who want to don't believe that America is the greatest nation on the face of the earth. We are one among equals, uh, and therefore we need to we need to be a leader in this way because we need right, right, Frank. We need the respect of the nations around us. If we give up on our sovereignty, these other nations they're gonna like us. They're gonna respect us. There's a big flaw there, isn't there? Well, there certainly is. I, yeah. I, I just have to say there's a small correction that I need sure, to please. make sure we have in the mix here, and that is what you said is true, of course. The founders of our country brilliantly understood, among other things, that if someone in the executive branch decides to negotiate a treaty that did indeed surrender our sovereignty, that could have a crushing effect on our constitution over which they had labored. So what did they do? They created a mechanism whereby the United States Senate is part of the ratification process on these treaties. It advises and consents to them. And the bar was set deliberately high. It wasn't just right. a simple majority, a two thirds majority of Absolutely. senators present and voting was what was required. Well, Andrew, the problem is, and you mentioned Barack Obama, he was one of the driving forces behind this in his administration. And Joe Biden is only too happy to follow his example. They don't have any intention of submitting these agreements, these treaties right. to the Senate for its advice and consent. Again, why? Because I think even under the Democratic majority, you're not going to get a two thirds majority no. vote saying we want to give up our sovereignty. And let me just say, tick off three ways, please, in which this is going to manifest itself. One is national sovereignty, as I right. said, not having the United States, our limited government representatives, checks and balances and all that, making decisions about public health. Two, they're surrendering the Biden administration, the federal government, not rights that they exercise, mm. because under our constitution, health policy is not an enumerated right. That right. is the responsibility of the states. So sure. they're giving up the state's sovereignty. But most importantly, I suspect to most in our audience, and I think some of them at least will remember the unpleasantness of the pandemic and what was done to them by the WHO. But think about this. And I don't think this is an exaggeration. So we think that the, uh, Frank, that the World Health Organization must have gotten a hold of your, your signal. You dropped out there for a second. What you were about to talk about was um, this gentleman whose name is very long and I can't remember it, becoming Tedros our doctor. Tedros Ghebreyesus. Yes, exactly yes. right. So the idea here is, and this, this may sound like hyperbole, but it's no. actually true. Under this arrangement whereby Dr. Tedros Ghebreyesus, who, by the way, has no mel medical credentials at all, is going to be able to be the arbiter as he was on an advisory basis yes. during the previous arrangement as to whether or not you can find out from your doctor what is the best treatment that that individual would recommend for you. Wow. Uh, in this case uh, of the COVID-19 thing, for example, uh, they said uh, ivermectin, yeah. hydroxychloroquine, early treatment with those widely available, very safe, very inexpensive therapies was impermissible. Right. And by God, that's what basically we adopted as the policy of the United States government. Now, imagine if we don't even have the latitude to say, well, that's very well, doctor, thank you, but no, thank you. We're going to get a second opinion. We're not going to follow your advice. Under the arrangement that the Biden administration is now prepared to sign on to, Dr. Tedros will be able to determine what not only you get in the way of medications, but even what you can know about those medications. Because another piece of this, unbelievably, you know, the Supreme Court's just been reviewing this whole idea of censorship. Right. And the government conniving with tech companies or anybody else to silence your freedom of speech or what you can learn from others freely exercising their freedom of speech. 
this arrangement will be baked into this set of treaties that the World Health Organization is negotiating right now. There will be incumbent upon every member nation to create a censorship mechanism. And the Supreme Court, you can uh, pound sand. Well, and, 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 and that's exactly it, right? Again, because these things, as we've been talking about, they're not done in the bright light of public scrutiny. You know, it's not, there's no treaty that gets ratified. What happens is that we sign the treaty and the Biden administration, the Kamala Harris administration, the Gavin Newsom administration, whomever, whatever Democrat president comes in, they start enacting it via the regulatory process. Or if they don't even want to go to the regulatory process, they do what Wayne Cruz at CEI calls regulatory dark matter, guidance documents and regulatory interpretation letters, or even worse, as is being litigated, as today was the arguments in, in, in the Louisiana and uh, Missouri cases, you know, a, a couple of bureaucrats at the White House putting direct pressure on these social media companies. I had videos that were knocked out of YouTube uh, mm -hmm. uh, under this. And my, my my partner in that in that podcast is the editor of Real Clear Health. I mean, arguably one of the great experts in what's going on in the world. So that's the problem, Frank, right, is we can say, well, we're not signing the treaty, therefore we're not obligated to it. The problem is there are folks who will in the name of consolidating power, I guess this is what it's about, really. It's yes. about power. 100%. It's about the power of government and the power of the establishment versus the individual, the average everyday American. They're going to say, well, they're going to use this as their, as their justification. Well, we, we signed a treaty. It may not have been ratified. We signed a treaty. Therefore, we're obligated. Again, getting back into this. I'm sorry, Frank, go ahead. Talk, talk about that. No, but you, you broke the code. Yeah, Andrew, this is, uh -oh. at the end of the day, all about power. Right. And when you look at those who seek to exercise power and the fact that they know the only way they can get it is by misleading you or yes. simply uh, deceiving you outright, um, that's not going to end well. Right. Uh, it might end our republic, but it will not be well with the rest of us, needless to say. I, I mean, that's where we are, though. We are now in a situation in which these bureaucrats are cloaked in enormous power. Some of it is Congress's fault. Some of it is just the inexorable, you know, rise and movement of the behemoth of, of, of government. The Leviathan. And some of it is, sorry, go ahead. The Leviathan. The Leviathan, exactly. In fact, I almost was going to do a podcast called Wrestling with the Leviathan, but but uh, my my colleagues thought it was a little little too uh, a little too uh, academic for for that. But that's exactly right. Um, and, and and so you know, and when you push back on the establishment, the establishment pushes back. That's what certainly one of the things that we recognize from the the four years of of the Trump administration. Mm -hmm. Donald Trump threatens Big the Trump. establishment and he pushes back. So what happens in in ten weeks from now? It'll probably be about eight weeks from when the podcast goes up. What 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 happens then? And what happens in the United States, Frank? Well, I hope in the intervening two weeks uh, between when we're speaking and when this is broadcast, um, we will have changed somewhat at least the trajectory sure. of all this because. I think what we are now beginning to find is that critical mass is being achieved by those of us who are raising the alarm. Yeah. Absent that, 10 weeks from now, you will see one and probably both of these treaties. And the Congressional Research Service, by the way, says they are under international law treaties, whether they're called that or not, wow. should be going to the Senate as of right this minute, unbelievably, the Senate has said, you know, uh, we don't want them brought to us. Right. We're not interested in doing our job. <laughs> and that's certainly the position of the Biden administration. So we will have a process beginning whereby these uh, provisions will begin to uh, kick in and be yeah. implemented with the assent of our own government, but not Let me the ask you this, because this was a debate that my colleagues at the Competitive Enterprise Institute had when George W. Bush came into power, and there was a demand, not a demand, well, you know, with CEI, it was certainly a demand that George Bush unsign Kyoto. Mm -hmm. And there were important reasons why they were asking George Bush to unsign Kyoto. This goes to the Senate, and it gets defeated, right? Let's say that a Republican gets elected president, 
and and the the Senate comes in in largely Republican hands, but you know, a Republican Senate majority leader brings this these two treaties to the floor and they're voted down. That doesn't does it get rid of them? Does it say if we decide we're not going to ratify the treaty, can it be brought back to be ratified again down the road, or does that you know end it? I, I think it can. You know, okay. uh, I was very actively involved in a, a previous treaty fight involving uh, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. Oh, sure. And it actually was voted down, not just by 34 votes, but by 51, as I recall. Sure. We are still observing the terms of that treaty. In fact, more than observing them. And I think uh, it could be ratified at will, but the, if, if the votes are there. But I'm not sure they would be. But the point is, and you're absolutely right to make this right. point, we're looking at a situation in which they're not even going to go through the motions right. unless we insist upon it. And in fact, one of the things we're insisting on right now is that the House appropriations measure that as we speak is still awaiting finalization on sure. foreign operations be along the lines of the House version, which said there will be no more funding for the World Health Organization. And unless and until they do get approval from the Senate for whatever they're coming up with, there will be no funding in the future. But here's the thing. Um, we absolutely positively have to get out of the World Health Organization, right. not just defund it, not just defy it. Uh, not just defang it, as I would like to see us do, but um, depart it as well. Well, given the control that the Chinese have over it, it would be it would behoove us when when you have an entity that is in the hands of your enemies. You know, it, it, while there may be some merit at some point in time to being a part of it, at some point in time you have to say no. We're we're going to walk away. Frank, uh, tell us a little bit about the the a little bit more about the book indictment, and tell us how we can find out more about the good work that you're doing. Um, well, thank you. The, the book, as I said, is basically um, a, a case with specific nine of them charges yeah. brought against the Chinese Communist Party, not only for the crimes that they've perpetrated against their own people, but crimes against us. And there are 20 specific recommendations as to what we need to do. But it starts with at least, you know, prosecuting the case in the court of public opinion. Andrew, if nowhere else. And though that may seem hard at the moment, I think it's absolutely essential, most especially with respect to the single, I think, most important of those recommendations. And that is you must end the leadership role of those who have been captured by the Chinese Communist Party. And that's a lot of people in government as well as in the private sector. You know, Ben Lieberman from the Competitive Enterprise Institute has a new piece out about the, the this insane part. I mean, the, the 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 benefits that China gains on the world stage, you know, between again handpicking the head of the World Health Organization to being considered a developing nation for the purposes of a variety of trade. I mean, this is you crazy. This, this is just this is just crazy. And your organization again, Frank. Uh, the Center for Security Policy, our website is securefreedom.org. We have a marvelous um, collection of uh, webinars that I would recommend at presentdangerchina.org, the Committee on the Present Danger China, which was sort of the feedstock for this book. And our television program is at securingamerica.tv. Securingamerica.tv is the TV show. Frank Gaffney, thank you so very much for joining us today. Thank you, Andrew. God bless you. This has been yet another episode of the Lunch Hour with Federal Newswire. As I've said, please hit the subscribe button if you're watching us on YouTube or if you're listening to us on one of those major podcast platforms out there. Recommend us to your friends and family members, your family members' friends, your friends' family members. Uh, please uh, do so and, uh, and keep listening and watching. I'm Andrew Langer. Enjoy the rest of your lunch. This has been the Federal Newswire Lunch Hour Podcast, hosted by Andrew Langer. Check out the Federal Newswire's family of websites, as well as their social media stream 